All attendees are in listen only mode. Hi everyone, welcome and thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, you should have been uh, on a What's the State of the Humanitarian Evidence webinar if you, that's not what you meant to be, you're in the wrong place. Um, my name is Elizabeth Stites and I'm a research director at the Feinstein International Center at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts. I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar, which is the fourth and final in our Humanitarian Evidence Program series. As of right now, we have 48 people actually online and on the phone. By this morning, we had 185 registered from over 90 organizations in 35 countries across all continents and, rep and represent <coughs> representation from a good mix of NGO, UN, government and EU, Red Cross, Red Crescent, universities and other academic and learning institutes. Uh, over 60% of those who registered said that they've used systematic reviews previously in their work. That's the main output of this program that we're talking about today. Only 3% said they didn't currently use research evidence at all. So we're starting in a good place for our discussion today. We all have different experiences of evidence generation and use, however, and across a range of communities and practice and settings. We think it's important to bear that in mind during the conversation. We've scheduled 1.5 hours for this webinar, so we'll be aiming to close by or before 11 a.m. East Coast time and Toronto time and 4 p.m. UK time. Please feel free to send questions into us at any point via the chat or question panel. Our team here will be collating them and we'll be attempting to get through as many of them as we can at the end of the session. Just as a quick reminder, we are recording today's session. A brief introduction, the Humanitarian Evidence Program is a partnership between Oxfam and the Feinstein International Center at Tufts, and we were funded through the Humanitarian Innovation and Evidence Program at DFID. We've worked with over 30 authors and researchers, and the program has systematically searched the evidence base in response to eight key questions relating to humanitarian interventions and approaches, and has critically appraised and synthesized around 250 individuals pieces of research, both academic and gray literature, and also program reports and evaluations, in order to provide a synthesis of the best available research evidence on the influence and impact of key humanitarian approaches and interventions. In other words, what works? And also, a clear indication of the evidence gaps and some recommendations about potential ways to address this. The outputs of this work were published in the form of eight systematic reviews and evidence briefs earlier this year. This is the fourth and final webinar in our series. If you joined us for one of the previous webinars this month, this one will be a little different in that we are not focusing only on a specific area of practice, but commenting on our relative experiences of humanitarian evidence as a whole. Today's topic, therefore, is understanding practice for improving the generation and use of humanitarian evidence. And today we're delighted to be joined on the, on the panel by Carol Kuzba, co-author of the program's systematic review on the impact of food aid of pastoral livelihoods, as well as several of his co-authors. Welcome to Carol. Also, Alice Obrecht, a research fellow from ALMAP. Thank you so much for joining us, Alice. And Colette Fearon, the Deputy Humanitarian Director from the Global Humanitarian Team at Oxfam. Hi, Colette, and thanks so much for offering us your insights today. And lastly, we are thrilled to welcome as our discussant, Greg Gottlieb, who recently started his tenure as the new director at the Feinstein International Center this August. Greg will draw on his long career in humanitarian action to contextualize some of our findings and the implications for decision makings and makers and practitioners. Welcome to Greg. We will now set the stage for the discussion by hearing what a systematic review process can reveal about the availability of humanitarian evidence. Carol, over to you to share the key findings of your systematic review and how those tie to broader themes on evidence. Thank you very much. Over to you, Carol. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I'm looking forward to sharing our findings with you and to our discussion about our review and about evidence synthesis uh, more broadly. Uh, so one of the key challenges that both humanitarian practitioners and researchers face in their work is answering the basic question that I think Liz has just identified. So what works 
what humanitarian interventions achieve their stated objectives? And more broadly, what um, are the impacts, both intentional and unintentional, of humanitarian assistance? And answering these questions is difficult for a number of reasons. Uh, much of the evidence on humanitarian interventions is contained in academic publications that are either gated or only available in paper copies. Many practitioners, in particular, cannot access such material. Overall, the evidence based on humanitarian interventions is quite large, and the number of studies, studies can be simply quite um, overwhelming. So, an individual interested in the efficacy of a particular type of intervention is likely to be unable to go through a large number of studies. However, selecting a single study carries several risks. Uh, the sort of evidence contained in a selected study may be limited, but it may be difficult for an individual to assess the quality of evidence the study presents. Uh, the single study selected may also misrepresent the balance of evidence, may be biased or tenden tendentious or cherry pick the evidence that it presents. Um, and even if the authors of that particular study are guilty of none of these violations, the evidence that they present will nonetheless relate to a particular geographic or temporal context and the specific sample. Uh, so if an individual interested in engaging the efficacy of that specific type of intervention accepts the offered evidence at face value, uh, the assessment will necessarily be biased. And evidence syntheses can help both humanitarian practitioners and researchers to avoid these risks, to um, avoid these pitfalls. A well-designed evidence synthesis rigorously evaluates the balance of evidence. It assesses the strength of evidence presented in the included publications. Uh, because it involves the analysis of the entire body of evidence on the phenomenon under consideration, its findings are representative. This ensures great objectivity and, depending on the nature of the evidence synthesis, uh, uh, greater generalizability. And as a result of that, it allows an accurate assessment of the evidence and, depending on the strength of evidence, of uh, the whole phenomenon that is under consideration. Um, and importantly, if only because an evidence synthesis assesses all available evidence, it removes some of the access restrictions that I mentioned earlier, especially when, as is the case with our studies in the Humanitarian Evidence Program and with many others, the evidence syntheses are ungated. So just by way of introduction to the purpose and benefits of evidence syntheses. Let's now turn to the evidence synthesis that I undertook together with my co-authors, Tyler O'Neill and Patricia Ayala, who are both here with us today. So humanitarian crises have affected large numbers of pastures and have led to a whole range of humanitarian interventions. These interventions have mobilized considerable resources in an attempt to alleviate suffering and to improve the viability of pastoral livelihoods. However, evidence on the effects that these interventions have had on pastoralists is at best very fragmentary. And this includes both the interventions efficacy, that is their ability to achieve their stated objectives, and other possibly unintentional effects. So there is there is clearly great need for systematic evidence of the impacts of humanitarian interventions on pastures to inform policy and to suggest a both future research and you know, broader program monitoring agenda. So the purpose of our review was to figure out what evidence on the subject there is. And we used evidence synthesis methods and specifically an adapted scoping study approach to uh, identify, synthesize, evaluate, and estimate both the short and long-term effects of the provision of in-kind food assistance in the context of humanitarian crises uh, on pastoralists and their livelihoods. And to clarify, our study covers all pastoralist populations and in-kind food assistance provision during or after humanitarian crises. Uh, where possible, we try to compare the changes experienced by populations under considerations uh, under consideration to other relevant populations. And we looked at a range of outcomes that correspond to their specific research questions. Just to save time uh, right now, I'll identify these outcomes when I discuss the findings of uh, this study in just a few moments. Um, so an initial search of academic databases and grey literature sources identified around 25,000 publications. We included grey literature in our search because we wanted to systematically identify all available evidence on the subject, irrespective of where it was published uh, or if it was uh, formally published. Out of uh, those 
25,000 publications, 24 documents, of which cor corresponds to 0.1% of the total, were further assessed for data abstraction and assessment of the strength of evidence. And the flowchart that details the screening process is on, on the slide. Uh, we can talk about it further if uh, uh, people are interested in that. And the selected publications report food assistance provided to pastures mostly in East Africa and the Horn, and uh, a few more details on the previous slide as well. But now let's uh, quickly go through the findings. Um, so in terms of changes in livelihood strategies and asset and income dynamics, which was one of the uh, outcomes that we were interested in, we found that food assistance can uh, actually undermine the livelihood strategies of pastoralists. Food assistance can lead to reduce livestock sale and strengthen herd growth as a more positive outcome. Uh, and food assistance can also potentially fill gaps in pastoralist incomes. On the other hand, food assistance can lead to changes in pastoralist mobility patterns and especially to sedentarization. In terms of access to in-kind food assistance, food assistance to pastures has uh, at times been insufficient or unbalanced in terms of the diet uh, and nutrition provided to uh, pastures populations. Uh, food assistance has been claimed in some of the studies considered to lead to dependency, uh, but no empirical evidence in support of this claim is offered in any of the research that we've uh, assessed. Uh, food assistance is also claimed to lead to an increase in alcohol production and consumption. Um, and not surprisingly, food assistance targeting has at times been controversial within uh, the targeted uh, populations. In terms of the household and individual level social demographic factors, um, food assistance can encourage women to seek alternative livelihood strategies beyond pastoral production. And according to most publications, food assistance do achieve the primary goal of decreased malnutrition. Other publications report, however, that food assistance can have negative impacts on uh, the health outcomes of their recipients. Uh, we're also interested in the impact of humanitarian uh, interventions on social relations and on governance. And uh, according to the studies that we've um, looked at, food assistance can both strengthen relations within existing social networks and contribute to the emergence of new political leaders and displacement of their prede predecessors, uh, which uh, may appear contra contradictory, but it's not actually the case uh, necessarily, but it's something we can discuss further later. Uh, we also wanted to um, look at the at any poss possible causal link between food assistance and security, but none of the uh, included publications uh, uh, claim the existence of such a link. And that is for me. So uh, thank, you, thank you very much. And back over to you, Liz. Thank you so much, Carol. We'll now turn to Alice. Alice, among other roles, you co-lead ALNAP's webinar series on bridging the evidence gap. What are some of the common themes that have emerged through this series and through your other work regarding the state of humanitarian evidence? Over to you, Alice. Great, thanks so much, Liz, and thank you for having me here today. I think the Humanitarian Evidence Program has been making a significant contribution to the state of humanitarian evidence, so I'm delighted to be here to discuss these issues with you. Um, I'm going to start by giving you an overview of LNAP's work on evidence and humanitarian action, then discuss some of the themes from our work, and conclude with some of the issues that we see on the horizon for the future of, of looking at the generation and the use of evidence in humanitarian action. So LNAP has done a lot of work around improving the evidence base in the humanitarian system, primarily by improving the quality of humanitarian evaluations. Um, but in 2013, we took a broader look at evidence, so we wanted to expand our view beyond evaluation and look at different types of data and research, and we looked at evidence at our 28th annual meeting. Some of the questions we were exploring at this meeting were, if we look at the decisions and policies we make in the humanitarian sector, to what degree are these informed by the best available evidence? What are the barriers around getting evidence used? And what do we mean by quality when it comes to evidence? It's important to highlight that we take um, a broad approach to evidence. We define it broadly as information that supports or contradicts a proposition. And we do this at LNAP because 
unlike the health sector, we, we see that humanitarians have a wider range of questions for which they need good evidence other than the what works question. So while the what works question is very important, we also we also have other more descriptive questions for which we need high quality evidence, such as the extent of humanitarian need, the geographical distribution of need in a particular context, and the activities of, of other actors, just to name a few examples. Coming out of the annual meeting, LNAP produced a paper on evidence in humanitarian action which outlined six criteria of quality, which you can see on the screen there. I'm not going to go through those now at the moment, but um, if there's questions, I'm happy to discuss those in the Q&A. Just basically in terms of developing those criteria of quality, we were thinking about both the full range of questions that humanitarian actors need to answer with evidence, but also trying to take an approach that's agnostic with respect to methods, so the criteria can apply both to qualitative and quantitative research studies. So moving on to the next slide, um, after we, we published that paper in the few years since then, we've been working on improving the awareness of the importance of good evidence in humanitarian action through sector-wide initiatives, one of which was the Evidence Lounge Coalition with Evidence Aid that we were a member of prior to the World Humanitarian Summit. We also co-authored a commitment on evidence at the summit that over two dozen organizations signed on to. And last year, as Liz mentioned, we launched a webinar, webinar series called Bridging the Evidence Gap, which is dedicated to profiling pieces of work that are bringing higher quality methods and approaches to how evidence is generated and used in the humanitarian sector. So in that webinar series, we've covered how donors and how the Sphere Handbook um, are using evidence. We've looked at issues of remote monitoring and how we can more accurately assess humanitarian presence and, of course, we were delighted to feature this program, the Humanitarian Evidence Program, on our very first episode of that webinar series. Finally, we've produced working papers that look at the intersection between evidence and a particular issue. So last year, we produced a paper on the quality of evidence in evaluations, which you can check out on our evaluations uh, webpage. And this year, we've produced a paper on using evidence for decision making and resource allocation. So moving to my last slide, what are some of the themes that really um, string together LNAP's wide-ranging work on evidence? I think the first theme is the focus on end users. So at LNAP, we think a lot about end users and how to reach them. That seems very obvious, and I know this comes up a lot in the discussion around evidence and evidence-driven humanitarian action, but it actually takes a lot of work and planning, which is one of the reasons why I think getting evidence used is still such a challenge. Just as a couple of examples, at LNAP we continue to see that a lot of evidence can be produced in a very supply-driven way without thinking about how those findings might be used by decision makers. And one of the nice things about the Humanitarian Evidence Program, I think, is that it started out in a very participatory way to identify the questions it would address, which was great. Even forms of evidence that are more demand-driven, like evaluations, can be underutilized. And there I would highly recommend that people look at the Evaluating Humanitarian Action Guide that LNAP produced, where there's an entire section that goes into the detail of how you can improve the utilization of evaluations, including listing multiple types of use and how to use tools like stakeholder mapping to identify end-user needs. I think many of those lessons are broadly applicable to other areas of research and evidence in the sector, not just evaluation. A second theme from LNAP's work is improving the quality of inputs. So this is sort of a, a back to basics point. We've seen a lot of advances in the quality of research or analysis methodologies being used, but sometimes these get impeded by some of the poor quality of the inputs going in. So as an example, humanitarian outcomes has done quite a lot of uh, high quality research using new statistical methods to understand access or access and presence of humanitarian actors on the ground in conflict settings. But they've been facing certain barriers in that research in terms of the poor quality of monitoring data from organizations on the ground, which ha they had to rely on as a key input to that, to that piece of work. We've also seen this consistently in, this <clears throat> in the State of the Humanitarian System report where we carry out an evaluation synthesis of all the evaluations that have taken place in the humanitarian sector over a given period of time. Now, this synthesis can only be as good as the quality of evaluations that go into it, and unfortunately, we've seen that that quality can be quite variable. And of course, the Humanitarian Evidence Program has also shed a light on how we need to get better on methods and transparency of our research.
A final theme there is communicating um, and how communication is just as important as generating evidence. So at LNAP we think a lot about communication. Um, learning is a change process itself and so you need to understand how that process works, including how your end user accesses and understands information. Thinking about how we communicate a lesson or finding is just as important as putting in the work for the research framework or methodology, and so we invest heavily in our comms capacity to do that. Now, in terms of horizon issues looking ahead, I think there's a couple of questions that we are starting to have better answers to and starting to pursue that I wanted to flag. Um, one of these is about achieving a more collective approach to evidence. So we've seen a huge increase in the amount of activity around high quality research and evidence production. But I think as um, another individual on one of these webinar, uh, in this webinar series pointed out, <clears throat> Kath Williamson, um, on the first webinar, there's a lot more we need to do to actually share this work and get a bigger picture of the activity that's going on. So I think Kath talked about sharing uh, creating incentives to share evaluations and in our community of practice we definitely work on that but I think it's also important to try and look more broadly across the system to see can we actually be more than the sum of our parts and there's some new exciting initiatives that are trying to do that that I'd be happy to discuss later on. The second question is do we actually understand how use happens? So I said you know, end users are really important, and we think about that a lot, but I think we can also question our assumptions about how decision-making works in organizations. There's been some really interesting work by people working on accountability to affected populations that are trying to really open this black box of decision-making in multiple humanitarian organizations. And I think for those of us who are really concerned about getting evidence used in humanitarian action, we can learn a lot from the lessons that they're producing. And then finally, are we thinking enough about the politics of evidence? Because we can often fall into the trap of thinking about evidence as a technical issue, but evidence, of course, is always going to be generated for certain questions and not others, and we need to think about who is asking the, these questions, who's funding this research, and thereby who's setting the agenda for humanitarian research and evidence, and also think about whose voices might be excluded from that process. So those are some initial remarks, and I look forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much, Alice. That's really fascinating to hear about the work that LNAP has been doing on this over the years. I'll now turn to Greg, who will contextualize some of these findings and discuss their implications for decision makers. Greg, we would love to hear your initial reactions to these presentations, as well as your first thoughts on how governments engaging in humanitarian action themselves engage with evidence and what barriers they face along the way. Over to you, Greg. Uh, thanks, Liz. Uh, pleasure to be here with everybody. A um, couple of initial reactions to both Carol and Alice. Um, when I looked, you know, Carol, I think when I looked at the impact of food assessment assistance on pastoralists' uh, livelihoods, what strikes me as somebody who just came from a senior government position is that as I looked at the document, it would be very difficult for me as a decision maker to decide anything with it, right? Because I think what it shows and the difficulty of the evidence as we present it is that there are, it works on this, in this instance and doesn't work in that instance. It can cause a problem over here, but it can be beneficial over there. And I think for any decision maker at a senior level uh, who probably does not have the depth of that technical knowledge or has is some years removed from kind of field work, it makes it very difficult. So that's the kind of report that I look at as a senior decision maker that would probably uh, rarely make its way to me because I would have a difficult time using it. And so I would have to look to our technical people to parse it. And I think the difficulty is that when it's not clear, the challenge for any government that funds large programs is uh, trying to understand for partners, what changes do you want to make according to this? In other words, what have we invested in up till now? And what changes are you are we going to make this time? In other words, what they're going to have to tell me as a senior leader is we were doing it this way. It's not as a good way to do it in the past. So I have to think about how I explain that to our funders on Capitol Hill or wherever, whoever else is funding it, whether it's parliament or wherever else. So 
that's the one of the challenges of trying to uh, make decisions on reports like that. And I think, Alice, your sense of politics of evidence, uh, very good about looking at the issue of who funds and what their prejudice might be. I look at it from the perspective of somebody who um, says to funders, yes, uh, this is the way we do it. And we may find out over time that indeed we, we haven't been very successful uh, at what we've been doing. We may have spent a lot of money doing that. And therefore, what's really important is to be able to explain to funders um, why we thought, you know, we have evidence that we can do it better, but why we weren't uh, doing it better uh, back then. And that is, that's one of the real political challenges for someone in a senior position. So uh, one of the things, so let me just come off of that for a second. And the other thing I would, you guys asked me about was, where did I find research? And I'd say at a senior level, um, not a lot of research makes it to the top levels, which is why, of course, at a governmental level, we have our technical people that I think are the ones that mostly are gonna look at this. And I would say, technical changes that get made along the way uh, mostly are made at, at kind of the working level and not at a senior level, which is good, which is the way it should be. Um, uh, I think in a number of instances, at least at USAID in my time there, we've made many, we made many changes uh, in uh, the way that we have begun to do our programs. I mean, the, the, particularly on food, for instance, as we look at cash, right? We've, we've seen over the years that, um, that we decided to do more cash as opposed to food. And that is a that got done, I think, at a much more of a working level and then filtered up to us at a higher level at a more political side of things. In other words, what more did we need to do uh, to, to convince the Congress to give us more cash as opposed to food? So I think uh, the one thing for practitioners to know is that the change can get made at a working level very easily. And it's not necessarily, um, ne it's not necessary for the senior leaders to have a good sense of the academic or specialized language. I mean, it is daunting for someone who's not specialized to really read some of it and understand what it means. And so if you, if the intention is to influence somebody high up, um, I don't wanna say it has to be dumbed down, but what it has to be is it has to be very, tightly explained and and it has to be incredibly convincing to make sure that the changes get made otherwise if it's not um it's hard for a senior leader to say we're going to make make a move on something without there being a really good reason uh to do that um i will say also that for many people um within the business i mean if you're a specialist it's great for people that are more generalists um, it is it is um, difficult to access uh, the research reports, and so I think it is incumbent on researchers to be able to come into those that fund them and give I think both a the tech the, the right technical explanation, but also um, to be able to explain it in a way that decision makers can actually do something with it, uh, if that's the intention. So. Um, uh, so let me leave it there for now, and uh, and maybe there'll be some questions later. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Greg. <clears throat> so what we're seeing is two key themes threading through these presentations, and these relate first to um, improving the generation of evidence, and then second to improving the use of evidence, as Greg was just really highlighting some of the challenges for government and donor agencies. So we want to talk about both of those. Let's start with how we improve the quality of the evidence that we generate. Alice, based on your experience, what are the three things practitioners and researchers could do to generate better quality evidence? Great, thanks so much, Liz, and thanks to my fellow panelists. So a lot of thoughts being stimulated here, but I'll try and stick to a few comments that I've already prepared on this question. So, so three ways that we can improve 
the quality and relevance of, of evidence. Um, the first way I think we can do this is be transparent. And I'm glad, Liz, that you've asked me about these are things that both practitioners and researchers can do to, together because this is a two-way street in many ways. So we consider the clarity of context and method at LNAP to be a key quality criterion of evidence, one that's really important. I think transparency would help solve a lot of the issues around quality in terms of um, making it clear how data is collected, by whom, and for what purpose. My colleague Alexandra Warner has been working a lot on monitoring lately. We have a new report that will be coming out on monitoring and humanitarian action in a few weeks. And one of her findings from that is that a lot of agencies prefer to conduct their own primary da data collection rather than using secondary data because they don't trust the source so they don't really know how it was done. So transparency would help that information being shared more reliably and could cut down on duplication. We also obviously need to see more transparency in the methods being used in research so they can assess their quality. On the user side though, I think you know, this goes back to Greg's point about trying to meet end user needs, trying to understand what those decision makers need at different levels of an organization, right? Because the person at the top of the government um, structure in an organization might have different uh, user needs than somebody who is running a country office. And I think what we've seen is that end users need to be more forthcoming about what their expectations are for the level of analysis provided to them and the ways in which they want to see data and evidence communicated to them. So one example of this that I've heard others talk about recently is trying to communicate, well, what are the consequences, you know, t telling a decision maker, what are the consequences of not acting on this research or evidence. So trying to make it more practical and pragmatic for them. But that's a, a discovery that has come out of end users and practitioners better explaining um, the information that they need to, to take in action. So we can't come up with that on our own as researchers. We need communication and discussion. A second way that we can improve quality and relevance is to make evidence generation more sustainable and more routine. So a lot of the research that happens in the humanitarian sector at the moment either tends to be carried out by organizations that do not directly implement humanitarian action, so ALNAP would be one of those and Feinstein, or when they're done in-house um, by organizations such as Oxfam um, and others, they can tend to be done as one-off research projects that are, that are then difficult to be, uh, difficult to use in order to continuously improve programming over the long run. And I think that goes back to Greg's point about being af not being afraid, but being cautious about trying to say, well, we got evidence now that tells us that what we were doing before wasn't working. I think if we start to embed research into implementation more and, and uh, invest, invest more in implementation science, we can better address those concerns. So that's one way we can, um, we can make evidence generation more sustainable and more routine. A second way we can make it more sustainable and more routine is to go back to what I was saying earlier about getting that collective picture of what research is taking place and then find ways over time to build those linkages, build on each other's findings and fill gaps and, and um, connect this at a context level, not just a global level. And to address that, I think ELRA, um, the organization is an organization that's based in the UK. Um, ELRA has been doing a lot of interesting work on this with their global prioritization exercise that's going to be mapping research and innovation initiatives in the humanitarian sector on a regular basis. That mapping report, uh, the first mapping report from that project will be out in a few weeks time and again really helps us to figure out how we can start to build more of a collective picture and make um, evidence generation and use more sustainable. And then finally a third way that we can address quality and relevance is by you know, focusing on outcomes and causal mechanisms. I was listening to one of the previous webinars in this series. Um, it was the one where WASH and food security were being discussed. And I think Helene Juilliard really put this well. She was the one who, taught, who was working on the systematic review of market interventions for food security. And she was saying, you know, we need to be asking these questions about you know, is this any better? Is what we're doing in this intervention any better? Is it better than doing nothing at all? Is it better than the standard approach that we were using before? And I think we haven't been asking those questions enough in the humanitarian sector, um, partly because we haven't really paid attention to outcomes and causal mechanisms. So we tend to ignore outcomes in favor of outputs, um, and that's a commonly known and acknowledged problem that we're trying to address, but we also 
tend to ignore causal mechanisms. And that goes, again, back to both points that Carol and Greg were raising about, okay, so we have a mixture of findings here. I'm in South Sudan. What should I be doing um, on, on, on these particular issues? Or if I'm in northern Kenya, right, if we're talking about pastoralism, what should I be doing in northern Kenya? And in order to get to, to those answers, we really need to think about relevance, right? So randomized control trials can be strong on attribution, but they can be weak on relevance, meaning that they're good at establishing causal claims in one context, but it's not always clear how relevant that is, how widely that transfers to other contexts. So in order to have relevant evidence, it's not just about establishing a causal relationship, but understanding the how and the why of that causal mechanism so we know how to scale or replicate a successful intervention to other contexts. So that's all I have on, on that particular topic, and thank you very much. Great, thank you, Alice. That was incredibly helpful. <clears throat> Carol, we're gonna ask the same question to you. What would you add to the ways in which practitioners and researchers can contribute to improving the quality of the humanitarian evidence base based on your experience with this systematic review? Thank you, Liz. Uh, before I answer this question, let me briefly discuss the limitations of our review. So I do believe that our findings are significant in that they fill a very conspicuous gap in the humanitarian evidence literature. They represent the first extensive attempt to date to systematically evaluate the provision of food assistance to pastoralist to pastoralist populations. However, we only have 24 included populations. This is a relatively small evidence base. But even more importantly, none of these publications presented evidence of high strength. Uh, all of them had low or moderate strength of evidence. So for this reason, we assess the overall strength of evidence as limited. And so due to the limited strength of evidence assessed in the included body of publications, our conclusions are necessarily tentative. And this is really my response to Greg's uh, comment. So Greg said that it's difficult to make decisions based on our studies, difficult to parse it, uh, form like quickly form conclusions. And my response is that um, this is largely due to the la this lack of clarity is due to the evidence uh, available, not really so much to the, to the report. Uh, based on the evidence that we have, I'm not really comfortable making recommendations about what kind of uh, uh, interventions targeted at pastoralist populations work. We still don't know what works. So our report is more a call to action to improve the evidence base rather than intended to make recommendations and like uh, make conclusions about what uh, interventions actually work. And a part of the concern for us as researchers investigating the impact of humanitarian interventions was the nature of causal claims contained in the publications. And this speaks uh, directly to Alice's comments about causal inference. So in most publications, a number of which have been published in peer-reviewed journals, causal claims were made in like offhand manner and without reference to analysis or data on which they were based. So I hope that our study demonstrates how inadequate the evidence base is. There's clearly a great need for further research that investigates provision of food assistance to pastoralists and research that makes valid causal inferences about the causal relationships between food assistance and different aspects of pastoralist uh, livelihoods. And the same applies to many other areas of the humanitarian sector. And such future research projects can take a number of forms, for example, cohort designs, you know, both prospective cohort studies, as well as retrospective cohort designs uh, that rely on validated methods. Regardless of specific research designs, establishing routine and standardized measures of the provision of humanitarian assistance can greatly assist in um, estimating their impacts. And such research should also disaggregate outcomes by age, gender, mobility patterns, and other characteristics, which I know has been a concern among uh, many uh, authors uh, in the humanitarian evidence uh, program. And the question is, of course, why such research continues to be so lacking in this field? And I know this is something that Greg will talk about next, and I'm happy to discuss this further in the Q&A. Q &A. Let me just say that if the evidence base on this particle of importance 
this important subject is so limited. And there is such discrepancy between the evidence that is needed on the one hand and the, the evidence that on the other hand actually exists. Well, that clearly demonstrates that the incentive structures of both humanitarian practitioners and researchers are suboptimal. They have deleterious effects on the recipients of humanitarian assistance and clearly need to be altered. Uh, but this, that's it for, uh, for me. So uh, over to you, uh, Liz. Great. Thank you so much, Carol, um, for those enlightening, if not uplifting, comments. Um, Colette, based on your experience at Oxfam and other organizations, and given your familiarity with the realities of evidence generation on the ground in crises, what are your responses to what we've heard from Alice and Carol, both about where we have gaps and the implications of those, um, and practical options for from a practitioner perspective. Thank you very much, Liz, and also for Carol and Alice for their insights. Reflecting on what um, is arising in this particular webinar and what has been said in the experience of the program, I think it's definitely um, a challenge that uh, despite extending to grey literature, um, there is a lot of legitimacy, I think, in, in some of the findings that we've found, we've experienced. I guess probably um, it throws out challenges to us as well as practitioners in terms of our responsibility for uh, using the experience on the ground and the connectivity with the communities and the work that we're doing and the investment that's being made to actually generate the sort of evidence that will help us evolve our programs and our thinking and you know our evidence base not just for its own value in itself but for actually feeding back into program design and implementation. Um, I think there's lots of things that we can can do routinely and um, I, I think one of the biggest challenges from this program is how many um, how much of the great literature was disqualified from final inclusion into the reviews. Um, and I think that there is a lot of experience and learning on the ground and we really need to be thinking about the program life cycle, how are we feeding the learning back into that, but also are there things that we really could and should be doing that would generate evidence from which the sectors can learn and that happens systematically across all of the reviews that, that there was probably less inclusion of low literature than we would have hoped. So um, some of the basic learnings that we have, you'll see on the screen there, um, that you would fully expect, I guess, for practitioners to include um, in their evaluations and could quite easily be fixed actually. So making sure that the sex and age segregated data is there, um, looking at the temporal and location specificity, just naming who has been spoken to in this, um, in this evaluation in order to be able to qualify it as more robust evidence. So I think overall, uh, certainly within Oxfam and um, I hope other agencies for the other sectoral views, um, we'll, we'll certainly be looking at our evaluation terms of reference and how our evaluations capture the basic information that require it to be used for evidence. I think that's a really, um, important checking of us to be better at that and it's easy to improve we would expect those things from ourselves um, i guess another aspect that alice has, has pointed out is the the evidence gaps so what's missing from the picture uh, which we don't always think about we tend to often look at the evidence that we're actually generating ourselves and not what's actually missing in order to answer the bigger questions and I think um, that would be really helpful from a practitioner's point of view to be thinking about what's missing um, and better contributing um, to those questions because we often know those things but we don't articulate them. Um, I guess there's also a big area for practitioners and for NGOs around data protection. So as we are collecting data and collecting evidence, we are in a world in which we increasingly 
accountable um, and have a duty to ensure that the data is stored, disposed of, etc., carefully and well. Um, and when you're in a, a crisis, a humanitarian crisis perhaps, um, where there's a lot of disrupt, uh, disruption, both in terms of infrastructure, in terms of supply of basic services, of electricity, uh, potentially security challenges, um, just not being overwhelmed and keeping the integrity of data collection, but making sure that you're actually, um, you know, uh, able to manage the data which you collect effectively, I think, is something that we need to think through a bit more effectively in rapid response. Um, and also that the, the goalposts sometimes shift. So when you're in first phase emergency, the things that you might be looking at might be very different to the second and third phase of the emergency. And how do you get that continuum going across the whole response and the whole of the lifetime? Because rarely do you have responses that remain the same. The nature of humanitarian responses is that they tend to be extremely fluid. And we should be, if we're feeding our learning back into um, the programme cycle and into the sectoral learning, I think we should be thinking a little bit about how we keep that consistency of evidence, how we keep the integrity of the research questions, uh, so that we really do come out with conclusions and learning on how evidence improves the quality of our work. And just finally, you know, just talking to a few of the team actually here in Oxfam and, and uh, on the systematic reviews that have spoken to our sectoral areas, um, just asking them around whether they learned anything from these um, systematic reviews, whether there was anything that was new to them or news to them. I think one area is keeping an open mind. Um, and if we know things, then we need to evidence them in order to counter the evidence that does exist if we don't agree with it. Um, and, you know, scrutinising, I agree with Alice, that scrutinising what doesn't work is a challenge, um, but there is also a role and a responsibility in, uh, instead of countering that with my experience on the ground says that this doesn't work, with actually demonstrating experience on the ground does work. So just making sure that there is constant conversation um, to increase the reliability and the breadth of evidence for support. Does that answer your question, Liz? Great, thank you so much, Colette. <clears throat> Greg, based on what we are, we've been hearing, what do you think donors and decision makers can do to incentivize the behaviors that work to improve the humanitarian evidence base. Over to you, Greg. Thanks, Liz. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks to the other folks for their comments. I, um, I, I think that um, one of the things, just to go back to what Carol and I were exchanging about the, his paper, I think one of the important things, actually, if I think about it, Carol, about the paper would be if somebody sent that to me in my former position, it might prompt me to ask the question, so what do we know? Which would, um, which could set off an entire, you know, effort to uh, look at uh, the state of where we are in terms of, you know, assisting pastoralists. I think that in some sense, there, it's the value of, of, of a paper that comes back and says, you know, we don't really know that much or we have difficulties. So one of the things I think that's important for us as a donor, at least from the donor perspective is, I think we have to make sure that our terms of reference are really clear about what we want. Um, I think we also have to um, be clear about the, ki the context in which we want this information to, we're gonna consider this. Because we may ask people to do research, but we may be faced actually with a very, with very urgent needs, right? Because we may find ourselves in the middle of a emergency in which there are 
new things, uh, different things happening, and how do we adapt to those, and whether what we can do, and whether research is adaptable to, you know, there's uh, to to that timeline or not. Um, certainly, the other thing that we're looking for is um, the question of kind of consistency, and that is finding out uh, as we uh, look at this. Uh, how it could be applied across many of our institutions because I think it was Alice that talked about um, the problem of one group doing a piece of research um, and then saying it's applicable to this project and then trying to generalize across others and I think that's really one of the big challenges for a donor is is if we're going to ask for research I think we need to be we need to consider whether it's more generalizable uh, across a number of groups that are doing similar work. And, and, that's, and that would be perhaps we need to look at um, when we do research, it's not just on a single project, but it's a little broader than that, particularly if, if, it's, if we think that the research can help us to improve the way we're doing um, something across a broad swath of humanitarian assistance. Um, the other thing for us is um, I think we, it's it's important for funders to understand um, actually what it takes to do really rigorous um, research because I think it's important to know, as I said, going back to my first point, what's the timeline in which the research is valuable or loses its value to us? And um, that is something that I think we need to let our partners know about, that that's a concern if it is, so that we can have that discussion. Um, uh, I think that it's important to, um, the other thing for donor perspective, I, I mean, I think at AID, we, we, take our, we take it pretty seriously, I take our research pretty seriously. AID has had a long tradition of that. Um, but, I think as we, as I look at many of the things that we work on in humanitarian assistance now, particularly conflicts, and one of the things that's been raised here is the value of the data. And I think what we hear pretty consistently is we can do research, but the value of the data is difficult. It's it's difficult to know the value of the data. And I think what I would want back as a donor from a researcher is, uh, you know, what. Let, let's be clear on what we've been able to collect in the past that might affect what we're going to do in the future. Because if there is a sense that we don't have good data, I think that's a, you know, our data is not as good as it could be. I think that's a really good place for everybody to understand where we're starting from. Uh, because I think, uh, I mean, I've been talking to colleagues that have been doing research on Syria of late, and that's, in, and getting a data, getting information that people can rely on to make decisions with is certainly a challenge, and I think we need to make sure that we're clear about that up front. Thanks. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, Colette, the same question over to you. Based on what we're hearing today, how do you think organizations such as Oxfam um, can incentivize these behaviors to improve the humanitarian evidence base? Thanks. Um, thanks, Liz, uh, and, and also to Greg. Um, interesting points, Greg. And uh, just to be clear, you know, there are some contexts where it's extremely difficult to get the data. It's also alongside, you know, security issues of collecting data, uh, security issues around storing data. So the whole data question is really, really important, I think. Um, and making sure that our research values on data is able to accommodate the practical action on the ground, I think needs to be thought through a little bit as well. In terms of, um, to ask the question, incentivizing, um, you know, we, we are all acutely aware, both practitioners and uh, users of evidence and collectors of evidence, that better data and and evidence should inform our programme quality and should make for better programmes, and that's the greatest uh, incentive, I think, in the sector. Um, there's also the accountability question, 
evidencing that the experiences and the interventions that we're um, facilitating on the ground are actually rooted in the right decisions made out of the right experience and legitimised by evidence. That, that would be very helpful. Um, there's also enabling factors that can, can really help organisations incentivise. Um, for example, within our um, humanitarian programming meal team, we, we include questions in our um, real-time reviews that will encourage actually the documentation and collection of data so that actually we can from it uh, root our assumptions in evidence. Um, same with the uh, HIT tool we have, which is a humanitarian implementing tool, uh, where actually the documentation and evidencing is frequently asked in the questions to demonstrate whether a country program has actually embraced um, rooting its assumptions and its decision making on the realities of the response. So I think they're really important and they do tend to be quite an incentivized incentive because countries like to do well at those sorts of internal evaluations and reviews. Um, there is also the donor uh, responsibility in it and you know we are often um, asked to, if, if, if it's a compliance issue, then invariably we will respond to that and we will try and evidence uh, robustly in compliance with the, the donor requirements. Um, so I think they can all be enablers and they can all facilitate good practice, but I think probably the most critical thing is if people feel that we are asking the right questions and that the responses to those questions will really feed into the quality of programming and a step change in what we'll be able to deliver to the communities that we work with. That's the greatest incentive for the sector. Great. Thank you so much, Colette. <clears throat> I now want to turn to Alice. Alice, one of the things that has come up, particularly in some of Greg's comments, um, has to do with accessibility of the evidence that is provided and how uh, the accessibility of reports, syntheses, documents, et cetera, uh, facilitates their use by decision makers, donors, programmers, and practitioners. What does your experience at ALNAP suggest about making evidence uh, accessible and making ev the evidence base on the whole more, more searchable and user friendly, particularly when we think about the importance of the large amounts of grey literature out there? Great, thanks Liz. Um, just before I jump into accessibility, just to have a brief comment. Um, because I think it's such an important point that we often overlook. Going back to what Colette was talking about in terms of you know, why we aren't able to, you know, what are some of the barriers of, of collecting better quality data in very difficult contexts? And, and Colette was talking about security issues. And I think, you know, we aren't talking enough about the ethics of data collection and how to collect this data in a way that's um, aligned with principled humanitarian action. I think there's a lot of protection issues and these issues are not going to go away. They're only going to get um, more significant over time. So I just wanted to acknowledge that point because it's a really important one. And just say even though we, we might want data collection to be uh, more consistent and of better quality on the ground, we have to acknowledge those um, very important realities and constraints. So just then uh, pivoting over to the gray literature that uh, Greg and I think also Carol were talking about um, the challenges that we've been seeing around the gray literature and accessibility of, of that. Um, so I want to talk here from ALNAP's experience on our lessons papers, which is one of our most popular ALNAP products, but it raises an, int an interesting question, I suppose, given the topic of this webinar, because I think internally at LNAP, we've often felt that 
while the methodology for those lessons papers is is okay, it's not as great as we would like it to be. It's not as rigorous as we would like it to be. So um, just to explain what these papers are, they are essentially a synthesis of lessons learned from previous crises organized around particular crisis types, such as floods, uh, slow onset drought or earthquakes. And so we've typically, you know, had a consultant pull these lessons together fairly quickly in order to respond or in order for practitioners to use um, in a recent response. And so one of the, the big examples we have is that a lot of agencies were downloading these and using the, the, the earthquakes paper in the Haiti um, earthquake in 2010. But so we've been thinking about how to improve the methods um, for these lessons papers and kind of bring a bit more rigor to them while still making sure that they are, um, we're, we're able to carry them out in a relatively short period of time and uh, not make them too expensive. And so that methods paper on how we're going to be doing the lessons papers from now on will be out later uh, next month in November. And just a couple of reflections from that process of trying to review that methods paper, or that methodology for our lessons papers, one reflection is that we need to improve the searchability of non-academic databases, which don't have the same sorts of Boolean search term uh, capacity that academic databases have. Other ways that we can improve searchability is through the better recording of metadata for gray literature, and just using more consistent tagging with search terms. You know, we all know um, this: the humanitarian sector is not for want of jargon, and we tend to use slightly different terms to mean the same thing, and that can be quite different, uh, quite difficult for people who are trying to find a body of literature when they have to use, you know, 20 or 30 different terms to get to that particular topic. Um, I think we can also move from being supply driven, so focusing on the answers, to being question or demand driven. So maybe having a database where people can type in questions or where information is structured according to questions rather than topics could help improve accessibility. Uh, lessons papers in the future will be much more explicitly structured around questions to facilitate this. And then finally, just trying to find the right balance between rigor and good enough. I thought the um, the person who was leading the the WASH systematic review, her name escapes me at the moment, unfortunately, but on one of the previous webinars said something great. She was saying how we can't wait for emergencies to stop until we get perfect evidence. Um, so depending on what the use is, humanitarian end users will just need some decent information more quickly, and that is probably going to be better than having the best information delivered more slowly. So we have to be aware not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good um, if we want to make sure that evidence remains accessible to end users. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Alice. That was really helpful. And the uh, name you were looking for was Danielle Lantain, who led that uh, WASH synthesis. We're getting a huge amount of questions from the audience, which is fantastic. Um, a reminder, if you have questions and you're listening to this call, please type them into the chat box on your webinar page. Uh, we're getting a mix of questions about uh, specific evidence synthesized, as well as broader questions on the quality and use of evidence overall. So we'll do a bit of a mix in the questions we um, take. So first we're going to go to Carol. Um, Carol, could you tell us a bit more about what the evidence shows regarding the links between food assistance and social networks for pastoral groups? Thank you. Carol, I'm not sure. Can you hear uh, yeah. us? Okay. Yeah, I can now. Sorry, I, I only just got unmuted. Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, uh, so uh, to answer this question, let me just uh, first reiterate the basic fact that the evidence we have is very limited and the strength of that evidence is equally limited. So uh, this claim that we present in our review is based on a very small number of sources. But what those sources say is that first, uh, one of the most extensive uses of relief food in uh, Turkana as part of an Oxfam uh, food assistance program in the early 1990s, I believe, was as an asset to be redistributed along traditional social networks. Uh, so be, because food was redistributed uh, to 
social networks to relations to uh, uh, kin of the recipients that, according to the author of that particular study, served to maintain and strengthen their traditional social networks. Um, equally, one can imagine, this is just my speculation, this is not something that is uh, um, containing in any of the sources, uh, one can imagine creation of new social networks which may also be uh, quite strong, especially in places where food assistance is provided to a target population over an extended period of time. On the other hand, um, food assistance appears, according to some other sources, to have contributed to uh, modifications of the uh, existing power structures in societies. For example, uh, Pantoliano in a, um, uh, in a study on food assistance provision in South Sudan found that distribution of food assistance created a new class of power brokers, uh, food chicks as she calls it, uh, who um, supplanted, if you will, the traditional customary, uh, customary leaders of that, of that society. The reason why I do not, so this, again, these claims are stated in, um, in isolation from one another, but the reason why I believe that they are not necessarily uh, contradictory is because one can imagine the continuation of strong social relations or creation of new strong social networks that coincides with the changes in the social structure of a particular society, and that change of the social structure may include the erosion of customary governance uh, systems. Um, and that's it. Uh, I just I want to keep I want to I want to keep my answer very very brief. If uh, anyone has more questions uh, to me on the subject, my email address is on the slide in front of you. So feel free to uh, to email me with any questions. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much, Carol. Next, I'm going to turn to Colette. Colette, we're getting some questions from the audience regarding the seeming disconnect between these important discussions on quality of evidence, which are often highly technical and unfold at a high level, and the life of practitioners on the ground. Colette, could you talk us through a few ways in which practitioners, such as Oxfam, can use evidence in the field? Yeah, I think uh, I, think I can. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Um, so to use an example, actually, from the pastoralist review, um, so the, the evidence that was emerging around food aid disrupting some of the pastoralist's coping mechanisms, for example, is, is really helpful and that could be used in a number of ways in terms of, um, I think, uh, using it, for example, if there are huge WFP distributions, as in Northern Sudan, um, that are blanket distributions potentially, you can actually challenge that back and say actually this is disruptive to the coping mechanisms of these communities that you're working with. So you can use the evidence to actually uh, challenge yourself whether your assumptions are correct, but also to use them as influencing points on, on activities by the humanitarian community in a very practical way. Similarly, I think sort of, uh, we've tried to build bodies of evidence in some of our programs around the impact of distributions during productive seasons when you've given seasonal tools in inputs, but there continues to be food aid distribution, for example, during a productive season, it disincentivizes people to actually um, use the seeds and tools. Uh, activities as effectively as they might if there was no distribution. So we've been trying to look at that. Uh, we use a lot of um, trying to, the work that was done on the markets. Um, evidence synthesis uh, was very helpful because we do a lot of work on markets in, in Oxfam and we were able to use it a to triangulate the things that we were also that were also emerging from our investment in, in that sectoral research um, but be also to inform and to flag the questions that maybe we should be asking at field level that that might be eclipsed by other priorities and senses of urgency around other issues um, I mean, I think primarily it's around design of, of programs, the selection of activities that you use. 
Um, I think Greg much earlier made an important point and, and so did Alice around how you communicate the evidence synthesis so that you bridge that gap between highly academic um, uh, language perhaps with the practitioners who really basically want to know what the three things that they must do to change, to use that evidence effectively in their programming. We also can use evidence in advocacy. Um, so I worked for quite a while in, in Yemen. And uh, when we began to do cash in Yemen, I think we were consistently told that that money would be used for CAT through our post-distribution monitoring and the evidence that we collected at field level, which was then sort of um, enlarged into broader academic studies actually we were able to demonstrate that very little of the money was used for cut chewing and that was really the primary block for donors to approve the funding for the cash distributions in the very very early days in that context so it can help advocacy to influence donors but also for donors to influence internally with their governments actually that the uh, activities and interventions that they believe to be the right ones are evidenced and that they, you know, that sort of speaks very much more to what Craig was saying early on about decision makers at high levels wanting to be convinced that, um, you know, that, that aid is being used effectively, basically. So I think there's lots of, of different aspects. I also think the, um, sorry, I tried to keep my answer just very short, but there is that sort of, that disconnect between anticipated and unanticipated outcomes. So I think that sometimes evidence can teach us the things that we didn't anticipate because we're not necessarily all knowing and <laughs> all knowledgeable uh, when we set out in the humanitarian context. Um, so I think trying to capture evidence helps us understand what else we're learning that we may not have on our radar. Great, thank you so much, Colette. Next, we'll go to Greg. Greg, we are receiving a few questions on the time horizon of the use of evidence. So for instance, while audience members acknowledge the urgency of crises and of needing horizon, uh, needing evidence that is immediately usable and actionable, they also want to know how organizations use evidence in the longer term, such as for understanding governance or local capacity. Could you shed some light on this issue? Uh, yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, you know, I think one of the points that was made earlier, Colette talked about data and security, and, and Alice, you mentioned, yeah, probably it's gonna, just going to get worse over time. And I think, you know, one of the things that is evident for us, at least, uh, at least when I was in the U.S. government, was that about 80% of all of our money now is spent on complex emergencies, which, as opposed to natural disasters. So, you know, we can, we can, you know, I know we, when the tsunami hit and when we had the Haiti earthquake, I mean, those are things, those are, we, you know, we're, we're better able to study what we do or what we did right and what we did wrong. Obviously, in conflicts, it's a lot harder to do that, I, I'm, you know. And so the challenge for us, I think, is to, you know, it's, it's, it's getting decent information and trying to help that, help us, uh, adapt as we go in how we deal with communities because as we are dealing with communities um, whether they're you know traditional or not you know not as traditional as we would imagine say the pastros to be uh, those those communities are also undergoing change at the same time because of the conflict and I think that you know that because that complicates what we do and because of the conflict makes it difficult for us to collect data um, you know, I think we have to be, as as uh, Alice said, you know, you have to be very transparent about what you know, what you think you know, and how that will, have, how we might use that to adapt our programming. And I think it's a real, I think we, we see that constant change and that's important, but I think everybody has to kind of be upfront about it, right? Because one of the worst things that can happen for from a donor perspective is if a uh, is if uh, somebody, if a group in the field is saying, yes, we're doing it this way, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And then we suddenly find out that it's not okay because, um, and that transparency has to take place. Everybody has to acknowledge the difficulty of that. 
But when you come to the issue of governance, and uh, that is certainly, that is another issue that requires tremendous uh, openness about what we think works and doesn't work. Because uh, it's, if you don't, if you lack real consistent access into the, the war zone, and I'll, I'll give Syria as an example, I mean, on local governance issues, um, it is hard to evaluate um, where, how well we are doing. And I think it takes, uh, for any group that does the work, it, it takes real openness with the donor about what you think you're accomplishing and what you're, what you're not accomplishing. Uh, it, it, it applies across the board because um, that's a very, uh, it's also a very sensitive issue because there are, you can be in the middle of broader politics, right? Of what we, for instance, I think for the US government in a place like Syria there and for other groups that are other donors that are there, uh, the politics mean that you sort of want things to turn out a certain way. You hope they are turning out a certain way. And when you find out that they're not, um, it, it resonates up through the system. And there has to be some way then for, the, for me as a decision maker to tell my bosses, yeah, we need to make a change. And to make that change uh, requires us to have um, a, a pretty clear understanding of at least what we don't know or what we suspect uh, we think is happening. And oftentimes, even in that case, um, change can be difficult because of some broader political uh, desire. So uh, it's a hard question to answer because there's there are many um, there are many things at play uh, as to uh, how we want to use the information or not use it. Let me stop there. Great, thanks so much, Greg, for that insightful response. Um, the next question is for Alice. Alice, one of the audience members has suggested that from what we have said so far, they come away with the impression that the major challenges are at the first stage, i.e. generating the evidence, as well as at the last stage, engaging the end user, particularly the senior decision makers. Makers, Does this imply that the middle stage, i.e. analysis and reporting, are far less problematic? What can researchers and practitioners do during the analysis stage to ensure ethical and rigorous evidence synthesis? Over to you, Alice. Great, thanks, Liz. Um, so just a small point to begin with, I think, um, Engaging the end user probably, I, I, I don't see it, that coming in as the last stage. So I think you have to engage the end user um, or in some degree or think about the end user at the beginning when you're thinking about research design. So when you pose your research questions, think about you know who's going to use those answers and for what kinds of decisions. So just a small point um, at the outset. But I think it's a great question and analysis is a really important issue. It's, you know, doing high quality analysis is going to depend again on the research question, the research design, the methodologies being used. But just some general points. I think ultimately you want to try and minimize researcher bias when you do analysis, right? Because you want to make sure that your findings are accurate to the reality or the subject that you're studying and not to how you are perceiving that. So there's a couple ways that researchers can do that. One is through triangulation of multiple sources of data and information. Another way to do that is to use, um, and these are not different options, but they can be done together. Another way to ensure that is to use a systematic approach in some way. So one example is that if you're doing qualitative research with interview da data, you should probably think about using a coding system or, or some form of, of qualitative coding approach to make sure that you're being systematic in how you interpret that data. And then finally, again, going back to the transparency point, just show your workings, no matter what you do. Explain to people how you you reached your findings and on what basis. And again, all of these points, I think, will be captured in the revision of the lessons paper methodology um, that will be out in November. And I can also pe put people in touch with Neil Dillon, who's my colleague leading that revision. Over to you, Liz. Great. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, next, I want to go to Carol. Um, 
And this will sort of pick up on, hopefully pick up on a number of questions we've been getting that have to do with what the evidence, evidence base says about gender. Carol, you spoke a bit about the findings regarding the impacts of food aid on women in pastoralist settings. Now, this is one piece of the gender puzzle, though, of course, we know that gender analysis, analysis extends beyond just women. Carol, could you comment more broadly on the availability of gender data in the evidence base? What types of questions do we want to ask, even if they are not currently answered in the existing literature? if we seek to take a gender perspective into account in improving the humanitarian evidence base. Over to you, Carol. Uh, thank you, Liz. As with my previous answer, um, I need to state at the outset that the evidence we have we, we, is very limited. Only one of the included publications from our study makes reference to specific impact of food assistance on women. That's a study that uh, uh, states that uh, as a result of food uh, distribution, some Turkana women uh, chose to seek out additional alternative livelihoods in addition to the uh, outside the uh, uh, pastoral uh, livelihood system of the Turkana. Uh, so the evidence is very limited. We know very little about it. Uh, so that's it about the study. But this points to the great need for the uh, collection of disaggregated data. Um, I think I mentioned that very briefly earlier. We need data that are disaggregated by characteristics such as age, uh, social status, health status, and of course gender. We know uh, that uh, women and the effects of uh, humanitarian intervention on men and women are often very different. Uh, it makes sense that it will be the case in pastoral societies as well, given the um, often very strict uh, definition of gender roles in such societies. So I think it is really um, essential is to collect uh, detailed data on how different aspects of specific humanitarian interventions affect different groups in society, including uh, uh, disaggregated based on gender. And I think that's the first step in figuring out uh, the ways in which different humanitarian interventions affect different societies in different individuals in societies. And that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, our next question is for Alice. Alice, a theme has been that we need to not only generate better evidence and synthesize it, but also to critically appraise the evidence that we do have. Some practitioners on the call want to know what tools exist to, to appraise evidence and what questions we should ask ourselves about evidence appraisal. I will also point out that the Humanitarian Evidence Program has a publication synthesizing evidence appraisal tool, which you can find on the Oxfam and Feinstein website. Alice, over to you for now. Great, thanks Liz. Well, yeah, in addition to the, um, the publication you just mentioned, I think there's there are a few tools out there. I think the criteria they look at are roughly the same or they overlap with the quality criteria that I, I mentioned at the start of our discussion um, from the ALNAP paper. Um, I would also say if people are interested in looking at um, a publication that kind of gives you questions, so more like a checklist approach, I know that Bond has something like that, but also our recent paper that I also I mentioned in my remarks around um, the quality of assessing the quality of evidence for evaluators, that has a checklist in the annex or towards the end that goes through each of the criteria. And again, I think while it was written for use by evaluators, I think it does have general applicability and might be worth a read. Um, just finally on that, I know that there is a guide that is going to be produced by Evidence Aid and LSHTM over this winter that is looking at assessing the quality of evidence, particularly in humanitarian settings and going more in depth on that. So hopefully that will also be able to produce um, some tools and offer some guide, guidance to how practitioners and people at the field level can think about evidence. Great, thanks so much, Alice. Um, we're now going to uh, go to everyone for closing comments, uh, and we'll start with Greg. What is the one commitment 
that you are each that you are making, and we'll ask each one the same question about how you will engage with evidence moving forward, in terms of either improving its generation, its analysis, its use, or all of the above. Greg, we'll start with you. Uh, thanks, Liz. Well, I think at Feinstein, you know, there's a we have a long tradition. I'm only here a couple of months, but I think there's I can it's evident we have a long tradition of very good scholarship which I think is important and we want to continue to, you know, with the, using the best, best methodologies that we can. But I think one of the things that we're focusing on now is how we can get that research, um, what, what's the, the, the research uptake? And uh, I think what we're trying to do is to take our research and to put it into more uh, digestible bites. And we're trying to put it into different formats so that it's accessible to uh, not just you know the, the the practitioner with the deepest of skills, but have uh, but perhaps with more modest skills and, and background, but so that they can access it. And we've also making uh, we're also trying to put it into formats so that it is uh, we can catch the attention of decision makers. Um, I can think of one recent report on uh, gender violence within the humanitarian community that because of the way that we uh, put it up online, we were able to catch uh, attention at, uh, at the UN at, from their decision makers. And so I think there's a real, we really wanna make sure that what we are putting out um, has an impact. Otherwise it's, um, it, it diminishes, I think, the, uh, what we do. And, and, uh, and so, uh, so that's where we're headed. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much. Um, Carol, what is the one commitment that you would make to how you will better engage with evidence, um, work to improve its generation, analysis, or use? Building on what Greg has said about the importance of making uh, evidence easy to digest, I think what's really needed among researchers is not just the commitment to uh, disseminate data because that commitment already exists, but also figuring out ways in which to do so effectively. Much, many of our findings are often difficult to summarize, difficult to digest for people outside of our fields. So I think it's a constant challenge for us as researchers to uh, present in our, our data in a way that does not undermine, uh, well, that the perp, like that, well, Repre represents um, our evidence uh, correctly, accurately, but also at the same time is accessible to the broader public and to policymakers, to practitioners in the humanitarian sector and, uh, and elsewhere. That's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Carol. And now to Colette for closing thoughts on um, how you or Oxfam will work to improve evidence across the board. Um, yeah, I think one of the, the main things that we're working at is demystifying it, actually. Um, so how do we bridge the gap between the experiences that we bring to the table as uh, international organisations? What is the value of the collective picture? Where is it valuable? And who do we work with to translate that experience and evidence into useful learning that can actually feed and inform our work are uh, probably the culture that we want to to generate um, so i think the what are we doing this for and what are we doing this with who are we doing this with what what, what, what we do it for and, and who with is really important and just ensuring that we have a culture where we see the value of how it can translate um, and demystifying it so it's not seen as uh, co-opting or um, taking on sort of agendas of other organizations to promote themselves I think is, is really important it's about what's the learning what's the practical use and how can it help us do better in our common task. So I will endeavour to continue to nurture that culture.
Great, thank you, Colette. And now to Alice, who will give us the closing thoughts from Alnap um, about the uh, how you will engage with evidence and work, uh, continue to work as Alnap to improve evidence. Great, thanks, Liz. Well, I would say, really, as a network that was established to improve learning and the quality of learning in the sector, I think our key commitment and role moving forward is to make sure that all of the fantastic work that's being done by our members, such as Oxfam and Feinstein, and so many others, is being shared, it's being widely accessible, and we are building that bigger collective picture together through annual meetings, through other learning events. And so we will continue to try and amplify the fantastic work that others are doing. And then within the Secretariat, I think we're looking um, now, after several years of building up our research methodologies, is to almost you know look back down and see you know what parts of these methods, which methodologies can we actually um, integrate into interventions themselves and better support implementation science and action research on the ground. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much uh, to Alice and to everyone else. Thank you all for being part of this panel and in particular to this series. And thanks to our fantastic behind the scenes organizers who've done a huge amount of work to make this happen. Um, and then thanks to everyone who called in for this and uh, previous sessions, if you were part of those. Um, this webinar will be available on the Oxfam Policy and Practice website, which you can see on the final screen there. Look under the Events tab on that site. Uh, and you will also be able to find the full series of humanitarian evidence program reviews, evidence briefs, and webinars on the program website. Uh, whose link you see here. Thank you all again, and I hope everyone has a nice day in your respective locations. All the best.